We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a podcast, a blog, and a YouTube channel that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 76 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. And you know, it's Sunday, and I'm recording this on July 24th, and normally I will record on Friday well, today's Sunday, and I'm two days late, so you can see that I actually forgot to record. <laughs> I was busy on Friday out doing errands yesterday. I don't know if I was really that busy yesterday, but I think I just kind of forgot. And then today, I was out all day, and I said, I'm going to get to my podcast. Because, you know, we've been publishing every single week for, gosh, almost two, well, year and a half, year and a half. So today, we are actually going to do three Q&A questions of things that people have sent me emails to ask me. And these are questions that are actually pretty common. And I'm pretty sure that I have answered these in other uh, podcast episodes. But today we're actually going to take real questions from real people and hopefully answer questions that you might have had as Gretchen, Elizabeth, and who was the last person? Svetlana. Yes, I love that name, Svetlana. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the first question. This is a question from Gretchen. She said, hi, Serena, I'm painting just the inside of an old Hoosier cabinet to clean it up, and I'm getting bleed through even though I am using a primer, a stain blocker. Can I just spray some polyurethane on the bad spots and use that to block the bleeding through? Thank you, Gretchen. All right, Gretchen, thank you so much for your question. This is something that especially if you are new to painting furniture, it's a nightmare. When you finally get ready to paint something, you're excited, you've got your paintbrush ready, you've got most likely a light colored paint and you're trying to clean up this thing and make it beautiful. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter how many coats of paint you put on that piece of furniture, it's gonna keep bleeding through. Even if you use certain types of primers, it's gonna keep bleeding through. And what it is, it's the tannins that are in the wood. And from my experience, it, it tends to happen most when you are trying to paint something like mahogany or some other kind of hardwood. It doesn't happen with pine or other light colored soft woods, but hardwoods, especially mahogany, I always find this to be a problem. Also too, I think it can happen with cedar. Cedar is another big one that doesn't matter what you put on it in terms of coats of paint it's going to bleed through. And this actually happened to me once. I found this really cute mid-century modern dresser for, I don't know, it was like 20 bucks. And my goal was to paint the entire thing white, right? Like the wood was not in good condition. I'll actually leave a link down below. The wood was not in good condition. And I figured, you know, I'm not going to try to salvage this with like stripping. And I think at that time, I wasn't really into stripping and saving wood. I was just into painting because it was so fun. It was, it was like pops of color in your house. So I was going to paint, well, white is not a pop of color, but I thought it was going to be an improvement. Well, the minute that I put paint on that uh, mid-century modern dresser, it turned it like a, a pinkish, it, everything just kind of turned pink, like a really blotchy pink. It was a white paint. And it didn't matter how many coats of paint I used on it, it just would not accept paint. <laughs> and then I decided, okay, I'm just going to paint, paint this pink. I'm going to do like, um, you know, different shades of pink and, and we're just going to kind of work with it here. We're going to blend it in so you won't even see it. Now, typically with dark colors, if you're painting your wood a dark color, black, dark blue, you're not going to see any of the bleeding through that you would see if you're using a white or light colored paint. So to answer Gretchen's question, the, the thing that you can do is to actually use a primer, but it has to be an oil-based primer. And what I like to use is something called Kills. They, I do believe that they make it both in a spray and a uh, brush on, but I personally think the spray is great to use, especially if it's not a large piece. If it's a small piece, use the spray primer. If it's a large piece, get the oil-based brush-on primer. And that stuff is tannin stain resistant. So it 
creates this layer where it just locks everything in and then you can go over it with your regular furniture paints. And even though it's an oil-based spray primer, it actually doesn't prevent you from being able to use the furniture paints over top of it. From my experience, it still works well. So it's not going to cause your paint not to stick or anything like that, but it just gives you a nice um, protected layer so that those tannins, which is uh, in the wood, don't come out, uh, you know, don't bleed through your paint or any other kind of primer. So definitely do that. If you also do not have or do not want to use the kills, you can actually do like a shellac. So you can do a coat of shellac over the furniture, which again, creates that barrier and, and will keep the tannins locked in. And then you can paint over with just your regular furniture paint. So I hope that helps you, Gretchen. I hope that helps anybody who's experiencing bleed through it. Gosh, it happens to the best of us. It has nothing to do with your skill level. It's just the nature of the furniture and you just have to have the right materials on hand. So always, definitely always keep uh, one can or two cans of the oil-based spray primer, such as Kills, or get the wipe on. Okay, the second question is from Elizabeth. She said, I have been scouring your website for a few weeks now and I love it. Your projects are beautiful and I can't believe the deals that you find at your local thrift stores. Anyway, I picked up a secondhand nightstand I want to redo for my five-year-old daughter's room, but I'm having trouble jumping in, <laughs> don't we all? Instead of plain white, I bought a man mandala stencil that I want to put on top, but I don't know what paint to use. I have little boxes of acrylic or little bottles of acrylic paint that I use on the canvas. Can I use those on furniture or should I buy regular interior paint from Lowe's? Also, my husband thinks I should spray the nightstands instead of brushing it on. So he picked me up a gloss white paint and primer spray from Lowe's. And then here's my problem. <laughs> if I paint it in the gloss white, then my stencil paint won't stick, right? I want to do this and have it be as durable as possible since it's going to be used by a five-year-old. Should I seal it with polyurethane, polyacrylic? What's the difference? Can you help steer me in the right direction as far as paint materials go? I'm feeling stuck even before I have begun. I appreciate any time you can give me a reply. All right, Elizabeth, this actually has so many questions in here because you're asking me lots of things. You're asking me, let's break it down. You're asking me what paint should you use Will those acrylic stencil paints work over a glossy spray paint? And then you're not sure how to seal it. So you're asking me, what should you use to seal it? What's the difference between polyurethane and acrylic? And there's a lot to cover here. <laughs> so let's jump into the first question. What paint should you use? Well, you can literally use any paint that you want, but it really just depends on the extra prep that's the, the extra prep that's needed. So for example, if you know you're using wall paint from Home Depot or Lowe's, or you just happen to have some leftover from your project that you were doing, painting your bedroom or whatever, you can use that paint. The only thing is that you're not going to want to use it right out of the can, right on the furniture and do two coats and think, well, I'm done. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to lightly sand down that furniture first. Then you're going to have to use a primer. And again, we talked about the previous question. If you do have some bleeding through, you'll need to use a oil-based primer that's going to lock in those tannins. But let's say you don't have bleed through. You would just need to use a regular primer and then you'd be able to use the paint, the wall paint that you would just get from the counter from Lowe's or Home Depot. That's generally how you would use that paint. You can do that. Some people don't want to go through the priming, the sanding. I personally don't do that because what I do is use paint that's specially formulated for furniture. And we talked about this in one of the previous uh, episodes. I believe it was like maybe two episodes ago. And episode 73, we talked about furniture paint. So I will leave a link down below if you want to go and check that out. But what I would recommend is to invest in some good quality furniture paint. There's so many Mark, there's so many like furniture paints on the market right now. You can really choose <laughs> any kind of paint that you want, and it's going to be made specifically for furniture. I'm not going to go too much into the different paints because you can listen to that on episode 73, but just know that these paints are formulated so that 
If your piece of furniture is in good condition, you can skip the sanding, you can skip the priming, and then just do your two coats for even coverage if that's the look that you're going for. And, you know, when I say skipping the priming, really the first coat is like the primer coat, but you just don't have to go and buy a separate product. You could just use the same product for your two coats and be done. So yes, you can use regular paint, make sure you're doing all the prep, but it also there is a product, and I do mention this in episode 73, there's a product that I love, it's called BB Froche, and this is a paint additive that you can put, well, it's a, it's a powder form, but you can mix that into your regular wall paint and create pretty much any color that you want, and it will turn it into like a chalk-based paint. So it's going to stick really good to your furniture, and you won't have to do all the sanding and priming. Now, if you're actually going for a glossy look, because you had mentioned your husband had bought some of the glossy white spray paint, you could go with a glossy look and you could either use that spray paint that your husband bought, which would be fine, or you can use something like Amy Howard lacquer paint. This is actually really great. I've never used it, but when I see the the pieces of furniture that she's done with this, it's gorgeous. I mean, she's done dressers, chairs, and it just has like a nice durable finish and it's it's really bright and high finish and Lots of color choices too. And I think there's more color choices with the lacquer than when you go into Home Depot and you just, I I don't know. I feel like their colors are just so basic that if you're looking for something, I don't know, beyond that, you really should maybe check out the lacquer. All right. But your question was, if you did do a glossy paint, would you be able to use your acrylic stencil paints? And I would say it probably wouldn't stick because that glossy paint has... Uh, what do you call it? Like it's, it's glossy. So it's got like a top coat that's locked into it. So if you're putting just like this regular uh, acrylic paint on it, I don't feel like it would stick unless you scuffed it up. And I think that's not something that you'd want to do, right? Once you've actually painted these nightstands, you're not going to want to scuff it up. So what I would do would be to, let's say, use your glossy paint. if That's the look you're going for. And then why couldn't you do another coat of spray paint over the stencil? and use spray paint for your stencil. You could do that if you're going with the glossy paint, but let's say you don't wanna do glossy and you just wanna use a regular, I don't know, furniture paint. And I say regular, but I'm gonna say furniture paint that's specifically for furniture paint. Then yeah, you could do your acrylic paints over the stencil and it'll be fine. And the other question that you were asking is, well, what should you seal it with? And I think this depends on what you're using to paint it. If you're doing the lacquer, And let's say, well, this is for a five-year-old. There's probably going to be a lot of handprints and things. I believe there are clear spray. Well, there's clear spray lacquer that you can put over top of your colored lacquer. And also, if you're spray painting it with the glossy white that you just mentioned that your husband bought, you can buy like the spray that goes the clear finish that goes over top of that spray paint. So let's say you go to Home Depot and it's Rust-Oleum. That's the brand that you're using because you shop there. They don't sell that at at Lowe's. That's an exclusive Home Depot thing. But let's say you go and you 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 get this glossy white. Well, that spray paint is going to have a clear finish that you can spray over, spray over top. So I would recommend doing that. If you're using regular, let's say, furniture paint, some of the furniture paints actually have uh, like a top coat built into it. So if you, even though it's for a five-year-old, if she's not going to be, I think it's a she, but if your child is not going to be, uh, you know, putting their hands all over it, they're not going to be ramming trucks and cars and dolls all over it, then you don't necessarily have to add an additional layer of top coat because again, some of the furniture paints actually have it built in. So it saves you a step. But let's say that you are going to go the other route. You're going to sand it down a little. You're going to prime it. You're going to use some of the regular wall paint that you have from Home Depot or Lowe's. Well, in that case, you may want to put something over it so it doesn't peel. And in that case, you could either use, as you mentioned, polyurethane or polycrylic. So I actually didn't really, I mean, I did know that polyurethane In my mind, I was thinking, oh, polyurethane is oil-based and acrylic is, or polycrylic is water-based. But from my research, and I will leave a link down below, a really good article that, uh, I think it was Bob Vila. And yeah, Bob Vila, polycrylic versus polyurethane. Polyurethane can actually be oil-based or water-based. 
and the polycrylic is only water-based. And I think it depends on the project that you're doing. It depends on if it's going to be getting a lot of heat, a lot of humidity, like moisture, then that may, you know, and your piece would not, right? But depending on whether you're using a polyurethane or poly polycrylic is going to determine, uh, you know, what this furniture is going to be used for. So for example, polyurethane, as I mentioned, it can be oil-based, it can be water-based. If it is oil-based, it's more durable. And that's good for things like wood floors or maybe a kitchen table or something that's going to get a lot of traffic, a lot of use. And maybe you're going to be putting hot pans down onto the table because you're eating you know, Thanksgiving dinner at the table. That is when you'd want to use an oil-based polyurethane because it is water tolerant, it's heat tolerant, and that's just going to be a better finish for those pieces of furniture. But if you use a water base, it is a little bit more uh, environmentally friendly because it has less VOCs, volatile organic compounds, right? That's the nasty stuff that you don't want to be breathing in. And that stuff will off gas for years to come. So, you know, if you're someone who, like me, you don't like to bring that stuff into your house, you're probably going to want to go water-based. So you can do a water-based polyurethane, but again, it's not resistant to high temperatures or water or moisture. And you just have to make sure that you're using the right one for how you're going to be using this piece of furniture. And one thing it says in my research is that the water-based polyurethane it will dry clear and it's easy to apply and it's not going to yellow over time on light colored woods. You will notice with the oil-based polyurethane, that stuff will yellow. And there was a blog post that I read once. <laughs> this poor girl, she and her husband had built this beautiful bed and she painted it white and didn't realize that oil-based polyurethane will yellow and turn that, that wood or the paint on that wood just a disgusting, blotchy, yeah. I think she even referred to it as like the color of pee. That's what it looked like when she was done because it started happening immediately and she didn't even really notice, I guess, until like when they were done and then it just kept yellowing and yellowing and yellowing. So be mindful of that. Oil-based polyurethane does not do well over white paint. So if you are using, let's say, a white furniture paint, for your daughter's, or I'm going to say daughter, it could be your son, your five-year-old uh, bedside tables, you're not going to want to use an oil-based polyurethane because it's going to turn it yellow. You can do a, a water-based polyurethane. Um, you can do the polycrylics. Now, polycrylics, from the research that I've done, it is water-based. It dries quickly. And that's good. So if you're doing small pieces, if you're doing a large piece, you're not going to want to use polycrylics because it dries so quickly, it's going to be blotchy as you're trying to move from, you know, one end of the dresser to the other end of the dresser. It's it's going to dry quickly and give you that uneven surface temperature or not surface temperature, that uneven surface, <laughs> surface temperature. Anyway, my mind sometimes just goes much more quickly. What I was trying to say is that if you have high temperature you don't want to use a polycrylic because it's not resistant to the high temps or water. So if you're doing the dining room table, skip the polycrylic. You can keep that for your daughter or your son's bedside tables, which is perfectly fine. And it tends to be a little cheaper and it's also easier to clean up because it's water-based. So you can just wash it and, you know, wash your brushes and be done with it. Um, now, if you do add too much polycrylic, it can take on a milky appearance to it, especially if you apply it over like uh, paint or like dark wood. You know, sometimes these these top coats will be milky and you worry about that, but they dry clear. But with this polycrylic, you just can't apply too much of it because it can, you know, take on that watery appearance, that milky watery appearance. And anyway, that's the difference. So if I were you... What I would say, what I would do if I were you is I would actually do a test. I would actually buy both of them. I would do a water-based polyurethane test sample and I would get the polycrylic. Now, I know that not everybody can afford to buy both materials, but you're going to use them anyway. You're going to have many more projects that you're working on. So why not have both of them? Because you may decide that you like the look of one more than the other. How are you really going to know unless you test them? So what I would do is I would actually get 
a piece of wood and I would do a test. Whatever paint that you're going to end up choosing for the side tables, I would do a test on a piece of wood and or actually have two pieces of wood and then use the polycrylic on one, use the water-based polyurethane and see which one you like better. What's the shine like? I mean, you know, is one, maybe they're both shiny, but maybe one has a better sheen to it than the other one. Maybe one looks a little bit more satiny and the other one you can see the brush strokes. So that's what I would say. Do a test and it's okay to take your time on this. When you think about all the things that have to be done before you even get started, it can be overwhelming and it can prevent you from moving forward on a project. But what I like to tell people is that when you start drafting things out, step one, step two, step three, and then you also add some testing in there, it really gives you a more solid foundation because you know exactly what you need to do from one step to the next. And the steps that you weren't sure of, you tested it out first, right? So if you have these two pieces of wood, paint it the same color that you decide you're going to choose for the bedside tables, and then test them out. See which one you like. And unfortunately, once you open the can, you can't take it back. But I can guarantee that just having this extra can on hand, you will find a use for it. Like, you know, I always find it useful to have more supplies and materials than to not have enough. <laughs> because sometimes things happen during a project and you go in a different direction or you change your mind. And it's great when you've got that extra polycrylic that you didn't even know you had but you went and checked your stash and you're like, oh, I can use this. So don't worry about spending money on both of those. You will use them both eventually. All right, let's move on to question number three from Svetlana. I love this question. <laughs> Serena, I have a question for you. What are the quote unquote must have tools one has to have for DIY projects for basic home improvements? Thank you, best Lana. All right, Lana, this question is a really great question because it is overwhelming to think about how much stuff that you need or you think that you may need at any given time for any project that you wanna work on. I mean, when I look in my garage, I have so many tools and materials that it can be overwhelming just to have that much stuff. <laughs> and sometimes I wonder if I need all of it or, you know, if maybe I just bought something for one project and I never used it again. So what are those things? Well, let's start with the power tools because I think if you have these, I think I've got a list of maybe seven things here that I think are good for starting in your DIY toolkit. Because the types of projects that you're going to be doing could be things like maybe you want to do a decorative molding around your house, right? Or maybe you want to um, cut some, you know, sheets of plywood for something that you want to make. Or maybe you need two by fours. You're going to build a little table or something. You're going to, I mean, well, that's not really home improve, basic home improvement, but I think that can be considered basic home improvement if you want to make furniture. I mean, I, I still consider that to be home improvement, but you know, if you're installing flooring, maybe you're doing like, uh, like a luxury vinyl plank. Well, you have to cut those to get them to fit around, you know, corners and things like that. So what tools are you going to use for these projects? So the first one that I tell people, you definitely need a power drill. Like I would love to do some research and find out how many homes own a power drill. Like I think even if you don't know how to use power tools, you have a power drill. That's the basic. And it's great to have because there's times when you're going to want to drill holes. There's times when you need to drive screws and trying to do some of those things like driving screws with a handheld screwdriver. It just, it doesn't work very well at all. <laughs> So definitely get yourself a power drill. I am someone who always recommends Ryobi because they're a well-known established brand. They're not very expensive and the batteries, and this is not sponsored by Ryobi in any way, but I will leave links down below for the tools, which are my affiliate links that will reroute you to Home Depot. But the tools actually use batteries that can be interchanged on multiple tool. I think there's over like a hundred different tools that Ryobi makes that you can interchange these batteries. And I think that's great because if you're, if you're buying just, let's say two or three batteries, well, you're always going to have one that's fully charged or two, maybe two that's fully charged. Once you use up all the power and the other one, put that on the charger and you can just rotate them around and move them from tool to tool 
no matter what you're working on. So that's one reason or several reasons why I like Ryobi. And if you're somebody who's just starting out, you don't want to spend a lot of money. Tools can get very expensive, especially when you start getting up into like the pro level of tools. And there's still pros that will use some Ryobi things too. So don't feel like they're just crappy tools. Now, if even Ryobi is too expensive for you, by all means, go to Harbor Freight. They th sell tools like no name brand tools for way less than even the inexpensive Ryobi. So everybody can get these tools and have them in their DIY toolbox without spending very much money. So power drill, definitely. But as part of that, make sure that you get a set of drill bits and driving bits. And you can usually find these for $15, $20. If you wait until Black Friday, they always have these things marked down to like 10 bucks. And you can, you can never have too many of them because believe me, I, if you're like me, when you're using these drilling and driving bits, they don't always end up back in the case where they belong. And so I end up losing them. So I have multiple sets that I just pull from and at various times. It's crazy. So do better than I do and actually put your tools and your accessories back. But you will need a set of drill bits and driving bits. All right, you're also going to need a, a, an extra set of batteries. So for all of these tools that you're using batteries for, you want to have extra batteries. So some of the tools that you buy are not going to have batteries with them. You will have to buy batteries separate. Again, this is another really great Black Friday deal. Uh, I think you can usually get like a two pack of the Ryobi One Plus. I think it's like the 18 volt batteries for maybe $100 for two. That's actually a pretty good deal. They're maybe about $150 for a two pack. So put that on your, your list of things to look for, but extra batteries are a must. You also want to get a jigsaw, a jigsaw. And again, Ryobi's great. You can get one for about 60 bucks, not very much money, but a jigsaw is great because there are times when you're going to want to just make small cuts, right? Like you're going to maybe just want to like cut a two by four for whatever reason, you know, there's things that you might be doing around the house and you just need a block of wood that's not too big. Maybe you're trying to support something and you just need a piece of scrap two by four. Well, you can use a jigsaw to cut that. It's not going to be the greatest cut. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily use that to build a piece of like expensive furniture, but it is a useful tool to have. And with a jigsaw, if you want to get I don't want to say creative, but you can actually, if you're doing something decorative, maybe, I don't know, maybe you want to do something for your wall, some wall art, you can get really decorative if you have the right blade on a jigsaw. You can use a scroll blade and that's going to allow you to do some, you know, like swirls and circles and things like that. And I mean, I, I don't see a use for that when it comes to home improvement per se, but I think I consider decorating to still be home improvement. So yes, there's a decorative element of the jigsaw that you don't find with other tools. So that's why I always recommend it. And it has different uh, abilities of things that it can cut. You can cut plastic, you can cut uh, wood, and on the side, you'll see where you can move it. I think you can actually cut like a, you can cut metal too, but it has to be like a thin gauge of metal. And it has a little uh, adjustable knob on the side. Based on what you're cutting, you just put it in that position of what you're cutting. So it's very versatile. I would definitely recommend to also have a circular saw. I love circular saws because if you're cutting a large sheet of plywood and you want to cut that thing quickly, or if you're cutting a two by four, or maybe you're cutting a four by four, you can use a circular saw to cut a four by four. It's not going to go all the way through, but if you're rotating it, cutting, rotate again, you can actually get through a four by four. So if you're putting up a new mailbox post, for example, you're going to need to cut that thing to the, the height that you need in order to get your mailbox mounted. And that's where a circular saw comes in. And again, Ryobi brand is great. It does run on the 18 volt batteries and you can get different sizes. I think they still make a six inch. And when I say six inch, that is the size of the blade. So there's a six inch and then there's a standard seven and a quarter. You really wouldn't even need to get the seven and a quarter. You can easily get the six inch, especially if you're just starting out and maybe you're intimidated and the bigger size just looks even more intimidating. Go with the smaller size. Now I will say, and I don't know 
the particular brand that sells this. Maybe Ryobi makes this. I think I've seen other brands that make this. You can get a little hand saw that looks like a circular saw, but it's much smaller. I think the blade might even be like, I want to say three inches. And it's just a little handheld thing. That could actually be a good alternative if you're intimidated by the circular saw. I'll do a little research when I'm done recording this so I can find a link to put down below. But I've actually been curious about those too, because you can just grab those. You probably just plug it in or it might have a battery and you can just do like a really quick cut and not have to pull out a big circular saw. A sander, I think, is definitely needed. And I mean, there's multiple sanders that you can get, but I think generally an orbital sander is a pretty good one to have. You can get it battery operated um, for, gosh, probably 60 bucks, maybe $60, $70. And you'll want to use that for refinishing, but I have found sanders to be really helpful in helping to smooth the drywall. Like, I don't know if some of you have remembered this, but there was a project that I did in my walk-in closet. I mean, I totally revamped the entire closet and there was wallpaper in there. And when you peel, when you peel wallpaper off, it can peel off some of the paper of the drywall and it leaves that, I call it like the paper bag look because you can see like that dark brown. And before you actually paint that or prime and paint that wall, you've got to skim coat that. You can't leave it like that because if you try to paint or prime over that, guess what's going to happen? Those spots are just going to just suck up the paint. And you're going to see that really dry spot that you just tried to paint over. So you actually have to do a little bit of skim coating, which is where you're taking some uh, like joint compound, right? like used for drywall and for taping. And you're just taking a knife and you're smoothing it over that area and you're you're blending it into the wall, filling all those cracks and voids and things like that. And after that's done, you actually have to sand it. And what I find is that using an orbital sander works best. It's very messy, but it works very well just to smooth everything out. And then you can wipe it down prime it and paint it. So a sander is going to come in handy. You just have to have one. And if you get the orbital sander, that's a pretty good one to have. But if you're refinishing furniture, you might want to look into getting something called a corner cat. And it has just a little point on it. And it's small, you know, it just kind of fits in the palm of your hand. And it'll get into those corners. So if you're, let's say you're refinishing furniture, and you've got where two pieces of uh, molding is meeting and you're trying to get into that area, the orbital sander will not reach in those corners. You need something that actually has a little bit of a point. So having a, a, a multitude of sanders comes in, it comes in handy, not just the orbital. Start with the orbital if you're on a budget and then you can add in the corner cat. I think that might also be called a mouse. They have sanders that are even smaller. I mean, just like a really small triangle that can get into those corners. And I'll, that leads me to my next tool. This is actually called, I believe it's called a multi-tool. And I've got one with Ryobi, but the sister brand of Rigid, they actually make one too. And they have all these different head attachments. So you can have a head attachment for sanding with a really small triangular head. So again, getting into those corners, but it can also be used for a power drill. If you put you know, attach that head to the base. You can use it for uh, flush cuts, right? So flush cuts are, let's say you're doing some vinyl flooring, right? And, or any kind of, any kind of flooring. And when you put the flooring down, you have to make sure that the door jam can be like the flooring can go underneath the door jam, the molding that goes around the door. And oftentimes you have to use like a flush cut in order to, uh, cut it and to get that flooring to fit. And a multi-tool is great because it already has that head that can give you a flush cut to cut out that little piece of molding there. And then you can just slide your flooring underneath and it looks nice and clean and tidy. So I definitely recommend to get a multi-tool and if you can get some of the heads, I think there's some that come with it, but if there's other attachments, you know, make it part of your DIY tool toolbox because it comes in handy. I would also recommend a nailer. A nailer is great because if you're doing like decorative trims and moldings around your house, this is what you want to use. 
right? Like if you're doing something like what I did in my shed, where I actually trimmed around the windows with just, you know, just regular, I don't even know what kind of boards it was, but they're not, uh, heavy boards. So, uh, you know, a nailer with a two inch uh, brad nail is going to hold it up there. And this is what you want to, to use. Now, if you're trying to do crown molding, you're going to have to use, now this nailer that I'm, t- I'm mentioning is an 18 gauge nailer. The 16 gauge nailer is a little bit thicker gauge uh, brad nails, and that is going to be used for crown molding. Okay. So if you want to do crown molding, go with the 16 gauge nailer. But if you're just doing light trim around your home, maybe you're doing baseboards, uh, just an 18 gauge nailer with uh, some 18 gauge nails are perfectly fine to use. But I definitely recommend that you have that. And then the last one, if you can, if you have the budget, I would recommend getting a miter saw. These are great for quick cuts. If you're doing mitered cuts, like at 45 degree angles, if you're doing crown molding, you have to use them. Well, you don't have to use a miter saw, but unless you're going to use a handheld coping saw, then a miter saw can come in handy to get that up there pretty quickly and give you great cuts. So that's what I would recommend for just basic power tools. You can do a lot of projects with just those things. Now let's talk about some of the accessories and the hand tools. So I already mentioned the set of drill bits and driving bits. You want to have the extra batteries. I also think it's helpful to have a bright work light. I don't know about you, but there's certain parts of my house that are just really dark and you just need light when you're trying to do projects. And not to mention sometimes you're doing projects late into the evening And, you know, the light that's on your bedroom stand is only going to get but so bright. So you need some additional light, especially if you're painting the room so you can see mistakes. So invest in a good work light. I will leave a link down below for one that I use. And I believe it's by DeWalt. I like it. The battery, uh, I don't really like the battery. It doesn't last as long as I would like it to, to, to last. But... I mean, this, this light is fantastic and it has a telescope, um, what do you call it? A telescopic, uh, head. So you can actually make it really tall. You can make it really short. It carries well. Um, I don't know. It's, it might be a little bit on the expensive side, but there are some other good work lights that are much less expensive. And I would just highly recommend that you invest in some, I mean, if you're trying to, uh, fix something underneath of your sink, right? Or maybe you have a little leak and you realize, oh, I need to tighten this up a little bit. How are you going to see your cell phone light is not going to be that bright for you to see. So get a really good bright work light. So whatever projects, home improvement or decorating or whatever it is that you're doing, you can actually see. I also like good paint brushes. I love purdy brushes. You can only get those at Lowe's. I believe Home Depot, I can't remember. I think their brand is Wooster. That's their exclusive brand. But whether it's Purdy or Wooster, I prefer Purdy. Make sure that you're getting some brushes that have a little slant to them. Those are great for getting into cracks and corners. And, you know, if you're like me, I don't like to tape off when I'm painting like walls and things. I don't like to tape off around the trim. So if you have a nice slanted paintbrush with good quality bristles like Purdy, you can easily just cut in. I mean, I find cutting in to be so much easier. (laughs) It's so much easier than having to tape like all these like areas. I just don't like doing that. So definitely do that. Speaking of tape, I personally like frog tape. Which one do you like? Do you like frog tape or do you like the blue painter's tape? I have to tell you, I feel like the frog tape is so much better quality. There are so many times when I have used the blue painter's tape and I'll put it, you know, this is the times that I do paint, uh, tape off. I will do some tape off like right around the the bottom trim. And then when I go to remove it, it tears on me halfway through. I'm like, I'm supposed to be able to like lift this up and pull it all the way to the end of the room (laughs) without it ripping on me. And I find that I, I just get better quality with frog tape. I'm able to remove that tape and it doesn't tear halfway down where I've put the tape, which is a big pain. So I recommend frog tape. I love them. Now, I definitely think that you need sawhorses and you can get some sawhorses, some plastic ones, a set for maybe 40 bucks, I think, 40, 50 dollars. This also might be something that you find in those Black Friday deals at Home Depot or Lowe's. So check on sawhorses if you don't already have some. 
They fold up very nicely. You can store them under your bed if you don't have any other space or in a closet. Put them in your garage, in a corner. But these are great for when you're working on projects and you you need space off the floor. You don't, I mean, you don't have to do it inside of your garage. You don't have to do it on the floor in your, your kitchen. You can set up the workhorses and keep everything up and off the floor. And if you have like an old door or like I have an old door that I, you know, can put on there. Or if you have just like an, uh, an extra piece of maybe a two by four or a four by eight sheet of plywood, that's your workstation right there. And you have to get some clamps because anytime you're using power tools, you never want to just hold these down, these pieces of wood with your hand. You want to clamp that and you have to get some clamps. So I think, I mean, just any of the plastic clamps that you can get from Home Depot or Lowe's, I like. Um, no particular brand that I can recommend for that one, but just have clamps. And also, if you're using your circular saw, you're definitely going to want some insulation foam. So if you go to the insulation foam aisle of the hardware store, look for the Pink Panther kind. You'll see it. It's this probably about a two inch thick piece of foam. And it's got the Pink Panther on it. Remember that cartoon from like way back in, was it like the 70s and 80s? <laughs> so that's the one that you want to get because you can use that as a cutting surface. You can cut right through it. I can tell you that I've had this huge piece of insulation foam for at least five years and I've never even replaced it. it. You can just keep reusing it over and over and over again. So let's say you've got your saw horses, you've got your clamps, you've got your insulation foam, you've got a workstation and it's something that you can break down very easily put it in a corner and not take up a lot of space. But when you need to work on projects or cut things, that is a good place where you can do it. You can take it outside and it's not going to be too difficult for one person to move those things back and forth. Now, I would definitely recommend that you do have the Phillips screwdriver and the flathead. I mean, I think at this point, everybody has a Phillips screwdriver and a flathead, but if you don't, you can get them for like two bucks each, a good hammer. And I would recommend that you buy a tape measure that actually has the measurements listed on it. There's nothing more frustrating than than trying to look at a tape measure and take accurate measurements, but you can't remember, what does that little mark mean? I don't remember what that is. And then you have to possibly screw up your project because you can't figure out what the tape measure is or you, you got it wrong. So tape measures now, some of them actually have the measurements listed on there. And I think it might be to the nearest eighth. So it's easy for you to know exactly what that measurement is. So get one of those. I would also recommend that you invest in a laser measurer. You can get one for maybe about 60 bucks. I've got one by Bosch. I think I paid maybe 60, 70, 80 dollars for it. But you can also get those for Black Friday. So if you're somebody who loves to do home improvement projects and decorating a room and all of that, you you have to know what your measurements are. And in order to do that accurately, especially by yourself, is if you just have a laser measurer and put that up there and, and just get the measurement of the of the space that you're going to be decorating, or maybe you're buying flooring and you need to know the square footage of flooring that you have to buy for. A laser measure, oh my gosh, it just makes it so much easier. And plus, there's some rooms or some spaces that may not work for a tape measure. Most tape measures from what I can see, have gone up to about 25. You can get one, you can get them for longer. But I know for mine, it only goes to 25 feet. So if you're trying to measure a room that's longer than 25 feet, there could be some some room for error. It's just, it's not easy to have to, you know, move the tape measure. Just get a laser, a laser measure. They work great. And of course, safety glasses, gloves, and don't forget, you have to have hearing protection. So those are just some things to start with. If you're just doing basic home improvements, these tools, these accessories are going to help you get these projects done. And I'm sure there's more things that you can buy. I mean, there's so many things that you can buy and there's things I'm probably like forgetting to recommend that I really love, but over time, those things will come. And remember, like I am trying my best to put together a power tools course for you. I've been talking about it so long and I just feel, when is this going to happen? <laughs> I should be working on it now, but my shed, it's still not done. I am sweating in there. And I finally just broke down after waiting seven, I think it's been seven, eight weeks now 
for my mini split. I broke down the other day and I went to Costco and I just bought one of the freestanding units. I'm like, I can't take this. <laughs> it has to be cool in here. Otherwise, I have all this great space sitting here throughout the summer and it's not getting any use. And when it does get use, I'm literally drenched in sweat. Oh, it's just, it's disgusting. So yes, I broke down and bought a freestanding AC unit. However, the good news is that two weeks ago when I saw it at, uh, I think it was, it was Costco, the Costco close to my house, it was like $465 or something. Well, after waiting two weeks, <laughs> which I didn't know it was going to be marked down, but it was marked down $100. I was able to go in and go back to a different one that still had some in, some in stock and I found it for like $100 less. So it was a huge success to bring that home. But now that I am going to have hopefully a little bit more air conditioning in there and comfort, I should say, I am ready to start working on putting some content together for this Power Tools course. People are asking me about it. They want this course. They want to learn how to use Power Tools. And I want to be the person to help you do it. So if you are interested in using Power Tools, you can go to thriftdiving.com slash tools into your name and email there. That is the list that will notify you via email. Of course, I'll tell you via the pet, the podcast too, that the course is up and ready, but you know, I've never done a course before. So that also has been my delay because I'm like, well, what do I do first? I could do this. Well, maybe I should do that. So trying to put it all together, that's the part that <laughs> can be a little daunting. But anyway, it's coming. It's it's like the big thing that I'm striving for. So I'm going to make it happen. But I just feel like my shed needs to be in that comfortable place where I could film and have it be beautiful and comfortable and still look great on camera. We're getting there. We're getting there. All right. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. Thank you, Gretchen, Elizabeth, and Svetlana for those questions. If you have a question about DIY, painting furniture, a particular tool or material you want to know more about, let me know. Send me an email, serene at thriftdiving.com. You can also find me on Instagram at thriftdiving. Send me a message there. And I look forward to coming back next week because we're going to talk about something amazing. Don't know what it is yet, but we're going to talk about it. <laughs> All right. I will talk to you next week, next episode. <laughs>